first off, happy new year. I think you can still say that on the ninth of the month, but when you haven't seen someone in a while, we're going to say you can still get away with it on the ninth. Um, I think I once had someone say happy new year to me like the last week of February. So, you know, these things are flexible. Um, but anyhow, I hope everyone had a restful break, although maybe not too restful because we did say we we're going to be doing some work during the break. And I know at least from my subgroup that we definitely were. Um, and I suspect that's the case with all the groups. Uh, so I guess first things first, um, do you want, I mean, you sort of unofficially did it, but do you want to call the roll so we can take attendance? Sure, I would I would love to do that. Um, so Mike Guild's game. Here. Yep. Um, Leslie Mayer. Here. Gil Barr. Here. Jill, I know is absent. Uh, Natasha Waden present. Marvin Lewinston, not present yet. Um, uh, Jim Dottilio? Here. Here. Great. Okay, so that is sort of the, the roll call in that regard. And then uh, for the voting members, and then um, Jill Conley. Here. And as I mentioned, Claire Ricker is here from um, the Planning and Development uh, Department, um, standing in for David Morgan, who is our Conservation um, Commission agent and also one of the individuals who has been named as part of the committee. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you want to take it from here. Well, yeah, why don't we why don't we take that out of order before we get to the minutes? Sorry. Um, because, you know, give Marvin an opportunity potentially to join us before we vote on the minutes. But um, I think Natasha set the table. But uh, Natasha, you want to say anything more before we maybe turn it over to Claire to say a few words? Sure. I guess I'll just provide a little bit of background. Um, we knew that going into this, David um, would need to be taking a leave. Uh, and as such, we had been working with the town manager's office um, to determine who that sort of stand in would be. And it, it made sense that it would be whomever would be um, assuming his responsibilities or, or overseeing that. And so um, Claire Ricker, the, the director uh, of the planning and development department here in Arlington um, is that luck is that individual and so welcome Claire we're so happy to have you here. Um, Thanks very much. And that's sort of the background on on where David has gone and and how Claire has has come about and what and how that decision was made. Um, Jim, I don't know if you want to add to any of that. Yeah, Claire, welcome aboard. Really happy to have you here. Um, do you want to do you want to? Uh... Want to say anything? Sure, I'll um <clears throat> I'll say a few words. Um, I in um speaking with the manager and um with Christine Bungerno, the deputy uh manager, they we were um uh, uh discussing who would um sit in for David. I know there's a lot of work to do. I know that we are uh, the intention is to meet what looks like weekly, um at least from now through uh, closer to town meeting. Um, so I'm happy to be here and um, participate as best I can, you know, with the understanding that I am, I am interim um, until David gets back. And certainly I'll take good notes and fill him in on anything um, he needs to know while he is out um, on his break. Um, the, uh, the, the newest Morgan has not arrived uh, quite yet, but we are all hopeful um, within the next week or so, um, David will be uh, out officially on his leave. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for thank you for having us uh, and joining okay. us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Mike, were you trying to ask a question or just saying hello? No, I uh, didn't have a question at this point. Okay. Just um, there. <laughs> yeah, and well, and I guess a question, Claire, is um, so as you're probably aware, uh, David had joined. We've we've broken down into some subgroups or working mm -hmm. groups, so we can be a little more nimble and kind of tackle some of these issues um, and then report back to the larger group. Um, he had joined the environmental group with uh, Mike and Joe. Uh, I assume you have no problem joining, filling that role in the subgroup? Nope, oh, that sounds fine. Perfect. Okay. I'll offer what I can. I am I am not the environmentalist that, uh, that David is, but I will, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as, uh, participate as, as best I can. Thank you. Good. Uh, I think that's a pretty powerful group you have there. So you're 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 you're, you're swimming with with uh, some fast fish there. So, <laughs> right. um, uh, so I guess at this point we'll do meeting minutes. Uh, you know, uh, I hope everyone's had a chance to look at them. I'll be perfectly honest. <laughs> I did a lot of prep for this meeting and forgot to read the minutes until about ten minutes before the meeting began. So, uh, but I looked them over. They look good to me. But I hope everyone else has had a chance. 
Um, are there any corrections, edits, comments? Okay. Moved to accept the minutes as presented. Excellent. Is there a second? Second Leslie. by Leslie. Uh, so Mike made the motion. Leslie seconded. Uh, Down Natasha, the roll. Did you want to call the roll? Yes. Um, Mike? Yeah. You... Yes. Uh, Leslie? Yes. Uh, Joe Barr? Yep. Jill is absent. Um, Natasha? Yes. Uh, Marvin is not present right now. Um, so Jim? Yes. Great. Okay. So that looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five for the approval. And so it would pass. Or... Um, I don't know if it's, I mean, we could, well, I, let's go to the next item and then maybe I might ask to jump around a little bit, but um Natasha, I think you did a great job including what you had, but maybe give us a little update on the correspondence received since our last meeting. Sure, yeah, so there was a lot of correspondence received. Um, forgive me for just one second. I'm a, I'm a bit out of sorts and I just wanna pull up the packet. It was 125 pages, so I, I, I wanted to be um, you know, respectful and not print everything out. So I, I will pull that up right now. Um, and so I will just explain a little bit about where all of the information is, is sort of coming from. Um, and how we got to this point. So I first and foremost need to um, apologize because there is something in here from Joe Connolly and a lot of information um, that was actually given to me prior to the previous meeting, but somehow I I missed it. So it's been included in this, this week's meeting. So um, my apologies for that and any confusion that that may have caused. And... Artificial. Oh, and I need to also recognize that um, I did not include the, there was so much material to include in correspondence re received. I typically include the um, chat comments and I did not include that somehow that that was missed. I will make sure to include those um, in the in next week's meeting or whenever the next me meeting is. So I apologize for that. I just got all kinds of apologies today. <laughs> Um, and I can't New, Year, even... New Year's repentance, I guess. Right. I was I was just going to say that, but we're into the second week of the year now. So enough's okay. enough, Tasha. Okay. All right. So in terms of correspondence received, um, we have received, like I said, uh, an email from Joe Conley with four attachments. Um, and so those have all been included. I wanted to make sure that everything had been included and, and whatever folks felt that they wanted to look at or discuss um, has been included in there. There is a little bit of uh, I, I think we've already maybe talked about some of these at previous meetings, but felt it was important to make sure that they were included because they were sent to us. Um, just going through, let me get through this. And then the next is a, an email, I believe. Um, something in here that is included that will come up in just a little bit is the ath athletic field project at Lincoln Park in um, in Lexington, and you'll see one of the last comments that came in was from um, Board of Health Chair from Lexington, Wendy Higer Bernays, um, who also submitted the same presentation, but also had some um, comments from the subcommittee that did the work on this, as well as her email explaining her her position on on this. So uh, that was in there, and I believe we have a couple of emails um, from Susan uh, Chapnick. Let me just. Sorry, I'm scrolling through this large packet. I, I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything, but does anyone have any questions thus far? Okay. And you know, every, there's a lot there, but everything's worth a read. So um, okay. to the extent you haven't looked at it yet, please do so. Um, we appreciate the submissions. Yeah. And so um, thank you to those who submitted. And so we had uh, an email from the easier way for me to do this is just go into my file. Um, from Susan Chapnick, uh, two of those, I believe. Yes. Sorry, guys, I'll, I'll try to do this. Uh, okay, we had uh, the first email from Susan Chapnick on 12-15, and there were, I believe, two attachments, so those would have been included. Uh, there was another email from Susan on 12-15, um, and I, Susan Chapnick, and I don't believe there were any attachments to that, so you wouldn't have found any. Uh, 
Mike uh, had sent an, an email on um, the first, I'm sorry, Susan Chapnick, um, no, 12-15, 12-15. Susan sent an email on, um, on January 2nd, 2024, sorry, as well. And there were, there were no attachments. It was um, just, I believe, maybe a link. Um, Mike had sent an email, Mike Guild's Game, uh, on January 2nd. Um, with some additional information. And then, as I had mentioned, the email from Wendy Heiger Bernays, uh, the Board of Health Chair in Lexington. So that should be all of the correspondence received. And again, I um, did not include the chat comments only because it, it totally slipped my mind. And uh, I will try not to, to make that mistake again. Uh, so I don't know if the group has any conversation or discussion they'd like to. No, other than I think they're Worth, worth a look if you haven't already looked at them. Um, so, uh, just pulling up the agenda, working group updates. Part of me wanted to maybe skip to uh, 2024 meeting schedule, but I think we can wait on that. That probably is appropriately at the end. So, um, working group, up, group updates. The reason why we took a slight hiatus was because we, well, A, there was the holidays, and B, um, it was to give the working groups a chance to do some work together and, you know, among individual members. I know I'm in the safety group, and I've, I've been, <laughs> based on a lot of studies dug up by members, been reading uh, a, lot of, a lot of papers, a lot of studies, and uh, it's very interesting stuff, but there's always more reading to do. Um, so, you know, I was hoping maybe the purpose of, of this meeting or the, the goal of this meeting and this item is to sort of get a report out from each of the groups, but, you know, you can keep it sort of, you know, like you did last time of this is where we're going with this. This is what we're looking at. Um, but if you want to raise particular questions uh, or issues, all the better. Um, so uh, I think the first group we have is health, Jen. which is uh, Natasha, Unfortunately, Natasha, it's just you, so you're right. going to have to carry carry the weight I'm, for this one. I'm happy to I'm happy to do that. I just wanted to interject for one second, Jim, because I know that there might be um, conflicting schedules tonight. Um, I believe Joe Barr yes, has. Yes, Joe, um, you're right. So and well, we also should move Joe's up. Yeah, we should do environment first then. Um, but one quick question, I guess I just wanted to put out there: if there are any other agenda items that we need to vote on, I'm wondering if that's something that we need to try and do sooner than later. Mike, I believe, has a a, a training. Um, is that at six o'clock, Mike? Uh, I'm not going to be going to that tonight. Okay. I did that one already. So that's not an issue. Okay. Uh, nothing to vote on, but uh, okay. maybe we should talk about the meeting schedule <laughs> then, because uh, maybe we should try to get as much input from those who are here. Um, so maybe we'll move that up first before Sorry. we get the subgroup reports and then immediately go to the environment group before Joe um, has to leave us. Um, so we've been meeting uh, remotely Tuesdays at five. Uh, I'm generally fine with that, but I know in the new year we said we'd reevaluate the schedule. That's kind of what worked for the first few meetings when we were getting this group off the ground. Now that we're running a little, you know, uh, more rapidly. Um, two sort of questions for the group. Uh, do we want to continue consistently with that date, with that day of the week and time? Uh, or do we want to choose a different day and week and time or alternate between, you know, Tuesdays at five? And so just in case, because we've noticed, like, for instance, Jill's not here tonight because she now has, uh, I think, through through a family obligation, a consistent commitment at Tuesday evenings, but, you know, she's going to sort of skip every other one to make it work. Um, uh, and I don't want to speak for her because she's not here, but I think that was the general gist of it. Um, also, we've been meeting totally remotely. I have to be honest, it generally has worked, uh, but, you know, uh, some people might really uh, long for, the, for a meeting with all of us together, uh, if possible, uh, certainly as we get maybe towards the end of the process. So um, I'll open up to the group. My two cents is I, I'm fine um, continuing to meet remotely. I think it's been effective, but maybe planning to meet in person starting in February, especially if we have guest speakers, you know, potentially. Um, as for Tuesdays at five, I'm not wedded to that anymore, but 
before we sort of go around and say what works best, if people are open to a different day, it might be better to just do a doodle, a doodle poll again and find out if there's another day. But, you know, what are people's thoughts, sentiments about this? So I'll just speak. Um, I can make myself available wherever and whenever. So I don't feel like I need to to weigh in. I'll, I'll try to sway with the group, whatever works for everyone. Um, and I guess just, you know, what others might have, if others have conflicts, I am fine with remote, I am fine with in-person either way, and I can secure a space if needed. Well, I'll jump in. I, I find that remote works well, uh, but I agree with you, Jim, that perhaps closer towards uh, the time where we have to uh, hash out some final uh, decisions, or if we have uh, speakers that a lot of people wanna hear, we should try to get together uh, Tuesdays at five works for me. Uh, generally, I am somewhat flexible, uh, although I know that uh, some Wednesdays and Thursdays for me are not going to work. But other than that, I'm fairly open. Anyone else have strong views? I mean, I think we'll probably do a doodle poll. But you know, any strong views you want to express now, or I, I just say the the remote I think could work well with some guest speakers because we have people who aren't local, so I think that maybe right. you know, that could cut both ways. Um, and I think time I'm you know I think doing a doodle poll for day of the week is fine. I think you know I've been happy with a sort of five o'clock time frame because you sort of get we get the meeting and then you can sort of have still have part of your evening to you know get other things done or whatever you need to do. So I think sticking with the five o'clock if folks are good with that would would be would be good. Great. Yeah, if we're going to stick to if we're going to stick with Tuesdays, it couldn't be any later. Uh, you know, I'm going to be hopping out the door at 630 quarter seven because we have a an in person meeting every other Tuesday for um, the Park and Rec Commission. But having said that, there are other days of the week that are not going to work either. Um, and I'm sure that will come out in the doodle the doodle poll, but you know, for January. So Leslie, were you, were you interested in like a later Tuesday time, like Tuesday at like seven or something, or no? No, there's a park and rec meets every mm -hmm. other Tuesday okay. at seven. So that's why I'm saying the five. If we're going to stick with a Tuesday, the five o'clock. Mm -hmm. So Jim, why don't I do this? Why don't I get a doodle poll out um, to the group? Uh, hopefully this week. I, while we're on this topic, I do want to um, make note that we're coming up against um, a holiday weekend, so Monday. I do think that we're probably going to meet next Tuesday. If that's the direction, let me just, if that's the direction that we're gonna go in, um, I have to have the packet ready to go um, much sooner than I Thursday. normally do for two reasons. One, I am actually gonna be out of town Thursday and Friday, but also um, to comply with the 48 hour um, you know, rule, I have to have it posted by Thursday at 5 p.m. Now I'm going to be out of here, um, by tomorrow at 4 p.m. But I will make every effort to get it posted. If I'm I'm going to be on the road, I can I will make sure that it's posted by Thursday at 5 p.m. at the very latest. But I my intention is to have that posted first thing Thursday morning and an email sent out to the group. Um, so with that being said, any correspondence that we will include the cutoff for the cutoff for that is going to have to be tomorrow at four o'clock. Um, okay. And, and uh, Natasha, we can talk about the, the agenda, but, you know, we're kind of at a point where I don't necessarily see new items. We kind of have some standing items that, you know, report, yeah. you know, weekly report outs that, you know, so I, I'll give you a call tomorrow morning to, to discuss. But uh, as far as agenda goes, this one doesn't have to get too, the next one doesn't have to get too creative from where we right. already are. Right. Um, excellent. Um, okay. Well, I think that's enough on that topic. And then because Joe's time is short, maybe the first report out will be from the environment group with its, you know, Claire can find out uh, what she got herself into. <laughs> Joe, do you want to start off or? Uh... Yeah, why don't you, I mean, you've been sort of coordinating things, so maybe you right. can give a quick overview and I'll jump in with a few. Well, I, I will just say that the um, more we look into this, the more there is to look into. Uh, so I think you'll all find that, but, uh, I, there are a couple of, of efforts that, uh, Joe and I have been undertaking. Uh, I've been looking around at other towns and what they've been doing in terms of turf fields. 
versus artificial turf. And I spoke to several towns and got varying different uh, responses in terms of what the concerns were and what they decided to do about the fields. I spoke to uh, Belmont, I spoke to Sharon, I spoke to a couple of other places, waiting to hear back from them as well. So that was one issue to see what other towns have done, what they found and what their concerns were. Um, the uh, five points listed in the minutes, which I thought were well described, uh, lay out a lot of information. And uh, I've been looking at non crumb rubber infill options. And there are several out there. I have not yet found uh, reliable or good or really any uh, assessments of the environmental impact of those, uh, other than the fact that whatever the infill is, it's going to move uh, uh, out of the field. So that's why the, one of the concerns of the environmental group is that. Um, I uh, am also aware that the city of Boston has uh, banned, at least for now, the use of uh, artificial turf. And um, so there are a lot of issues that are coming up and um, uh, there's a lot more to be done. So I'm looking forward to hoping that Claire can give us a hand on some of these points. But um, uh, there's, there's a whole set of issues as outlined in the minutes. So I won't go on at length, but other than to say that the information provided uh, that Natasha re referenced um, is going to be very helpful for us, uh, and especially looking at the environmental impact. So, uh, Joe, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. And I guess I've been spending a, some of my, some of the time trying to figure out or trying to identify other sort of experts we could talk to or people who have not so much necessarily experts in like turf fields per se, but experts in kind of dealing with playing fields. So I've reached out to, I'm trying to get in touch with someone from the MIT, um, their athletic and recreation department, Dan Martin, who's their head of facilities and operations, because, you know, universities are another user group that have had to struggle with this topic um, and also, you know, have to deal with, you know, uh, a lot of stakeholders with lots of strong opinions. Um, so I think, you know, as I'm trying to get in touch with him through one of my contacts there to see if we can, you know, if he has either expertise to share from, you know, MIT's decision making and or other folks that might be good resources for us to hear from. So hopefully that can lead to, you know, one or more uh, speakers. Uh, and then similarly, I, been, I reached out to Mass Municipal Association and heard back from them last night um, about, you know, they don't have, doesn't sound like they have a ton of resources, but I'm going to set up a quick call with with the person that um, Chapter Lane uh, referred me to and, and sort of see if we can, if they have either, you know, internal stuff they can share or other communities that we might want to talk to beyond the ones we've already, you know, heard from or, or, or been investigating. Um, and then the last piece um, is uh, just trying to, um, you know, figure out if there are, you know, other sort of resources like that that we can we can tap into but those are the two that you know sort of jumped out at me to help us kind of like i said get in touch with you know other experts um the last thing i just wanted to mention was this has come up and i can't remember if we talked about this or not in the previous meeting but this has come up in capital planning committee discussions about turf fields is the fact that um you know the in 2012 the state um amended the community preservation act to prohibit the use of CPA funds from being used for to pay for artificial turf. Now, some communities have tried to sort of do uh, go around on that. I won't call it an end run, but just sort of a get, get around that by basically using CPA funds to pay for everything but the actual purchase and installation of the turf, and then have you know found some other source of funds. In some cases, private donations, in some cases, other municipal funds to pay for the actual purchase and installation of the turf. That has become pretty controversial. Um, and so I think, you know, the certainly the 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 seems like the direction everyone's heading is unless you, you know, really want to have, you know, a lot of lawyers involved that probably you should stay away from paying for artificial turf for fields with CPA, which, you know, as as Joe and others know, that's a big source of how we pay for our recreation facilities. So A, I just thought it was interesting because, you know, it indicates some level of resistance to the use of artificial turf to the point that the the you know state decided to make it not allowed under CPA and B, you know, it certainly limits us in terms of our options as well in terms of how we might pay for a 
artificial turf field if that was you know something we wanted to do in the future yeah i would just add one thing to that jim and that's what joe was mentioning is the cost issue uh in the health safety and environment i don't see the cost issue specifically mentioned uh but i think obviously that's going to be something we need to uh, deal with as well, it's funny you mentioned that and that's a great point mike i mean we were talking about this in the safety group uh, that although it it wasn't technically part of our charge and although it doesn't neatly fall into any of the working groups um we would be i think remiss if in whatever final product we give to you know town meeting the select board etc if we don't at least make some reference to the cost issue um, you know the comparison of what it takes to um maintain you know build and maintain a turf field versus build and maintain an artificial turf field um and so that was i mean that's a point we can discuss now if you want but i mean i think someone has to look into it i'm just not sure any one subgroup it you know naturally owns that and i also you know although it's an important point i don't want it to crowd out the things that we were specifically charged with doing Having said that, I think it's a it's very relevant to this discussion when you're trying to do cost benefit analysis of various things. Um, we may need a new subgroup for that. I yeah, I mean, it may have to be a group called you know cost and maintenance. You know, uh, and you know we had we had this discussion at safety too, and and Leslie and Joe, feel free to jump in. I mean, you know, there's also different questions related to maintenance, you know, or, or, you know, what, what are you maintaining? Are you main, you know, maintaining a field, you know, how are you maintaining? Is it organic? Is it, is it, you know, are you maintaining it to a point where it's, you know, professional athlete grade, you know, um, the costs are very different um, depending on how much it's used and who's using it and the time of year and, and, you know, various, various factors. Um, so, although I don't necessarily want to assign it to anyone now, I mean, I think we should all be thinking about it to the extent you come across things that inform it, please hold on to it and share it with the group. Um, but it may be, it's, I think it's a bridge we have to cross. I just don't know exactly when we officially cross it, but soon uh, I don't still want to take from the work that each of the groups is doing, you know, independent yeah. of that, but I'm with you, Mike. I think for us not to look at it would be a, the glaring absence in our final. I've seen I've seen some uh, some figures on cost uh, comparison, but I think we need to uh, get into it in a little more serious way. Yeah, Jim, I had imagined. Um, sorry, Joe and Mike. Um, I had imagined sort of you know our working groups sort of getting a handle on the topics that that we're you know working through and figuring out what what research we want to bring to the group, present that, have the group provide some feedback about, yes, we think we're going in the right direction on this, that, or the other thing, or we need to look at this. And then sort of when we've ironed all of that out, we we might then, as a group, sort of start discussing those other pieces that aren't accounted for. And I don't know if then, and you know, let's just say maybe it's in two weeks, maybe it's in three weeks. I, I don't know. I don't want to be too premature or, or push this off too too long either but um that's sort of how i envisioned it that we we would all sort of take an active role in those pieces that might be missing um outside of the charge that we've been given by town meeting if you will i think, it's that... fair. I think that's very fair um because yeah we're not going to do this subgroup work i mean it will always be there but we're not going to do it indefinitely through and then just magically come up with a report so um you know, and in that realm, um, has the environmental group, it sounds like you are thinking, because uh, this is, if we have one sort of big goal for maybe by next week, or at least it doesn't have to be firm next week, but firmer than we are now, I'm hoping each subgroup, to the extent we're going to invite anyone uh, to speak to us from the outside who has expert knowledge in this area, or just any kind of knowledge in this area, um, having some names that you throw out there as possibilities um, by next meeting would be helpful. Well, it doesn't have to be by next meeting, but I think 
just you know if you want if you want speakers in february you kind of got to nail that down fairly soon in january because a lot of these folks would be helpful probably in busy schedules um and we've started doing that in the safety group um uh, you know some potential people to reach out to or some people we'd certain type of people we'd like to hear from but we just don't know who those people are yet um, so has environment kind of it sound like you've begun to think about that and maybe done some initial outreach Yes, um, that's right. And, um, but we, you know, there's a long way to go. To yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm hoping this is my vision. I don't know if it matches up with other people's vision that three of our meetings in February, uh, at each of those meetings, you know, one meeting, it's, it's the safety group presenting, you know, some speakers, the next meeting, it's the environment, you know, not in this order necessarily environment one each week, you know, we have some agenda items and then we, you know, put aside, you know, 45 minutes or whatever for to hear from one or more people who, you know, will give a brief presentation. And then really the bulk of it is for us to have a, have a dialogue with them to ask questions. The very thing that really didn't and for, for good reasons couldn't happen at the forum, you know, the kind of follow up questions that were never really, you know, I mean, it, this is sort of the opportunity for us to, you know, not just read someone's study, but to actually, you know, ask them the follow up questions you inevitably have when you read those studies, but, you know, couldn't get to there during the forum. Um, if environment's good, and I know Joe may have to cut out soon, uh, I guess safety is next. So I, I sort of give a sneak preview, but um, I think initially we did some out, well, we've been reading a lot, you know, Leslie and Joe, I think have, uh, forgotten more about this topic than I'll ever know um, and have uh, read a lot of studies and papers and are constantly finding new ones. Um, and I, you know, I think ones with very, you know, some with balanced views, some less so, but, you know, sort of essentially a sampling of what's out there on these topics. And, um, and it's been helpful to kind of get reading that. And today we had a meeting where we kind of talked through some of the themes we see, and there are certain themes you definitely see throughout throughout the literature um, and the research. But independently, Joe's also been doing some outreach to MIAA and some of the uh, some people in athletics to find out about injuries uh, and sort of general protocols related to turf and artificial turf. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the outreach you did before the holidays and then some things you've been finding since then related to athletics? Oh, sure. I mean, we, we, I did reach out to the athletic departments and, you know, first we were trying to see if there was any type of a central database, <clears throat> excuse me, central database on reported high school injuries or whether it was, you know, um, per school or statewide, and there really isn't, there isn't a, you know, a, a statewide injury database on um, when injuries occurring out there, they're kind of happening individually uh, as they happen at each particular municipality on whatever field they're playing on. Um, so I really didn't get too far there. Um, excuse me, we did, um, one of the things we talked about in, and Jim may highlight a little bit later is just, you know, one of the, Areas of concern was heat, and we understand that um, uh, turf fields will obviously get hotter. I don't think anyone's denying that. But if what was out there with regards to rules and regulations for um, uh, athletic play and heat, so we were able to find a MIA policy uh, on uh, temperature, and that's something I sent to Jim today. Maybe we'll get that to everybody um, next time, um, and. That's it. Yeah, and I think that's one thing we did talk about. Maybe connecting again with the high school department. Maybe talking to their training. One of the you know we we'll talk about who we want to bring in, and and again we don't know individual names right now. Um, but maybe someone from the athletic training corps at the high schools uh, to find out what they're seeing. I mean, they're the um, kind of the emergency personnel that are actually on both Arlington's turf and non-turf fields and get it, some opinion from what they see. Is that they seeing more injuries on the turf or injuries on our grass fields or is there no difference or what? So um, that's just some of the kind of local work we're doing with the high schools. And, you know, 
what we're seeing is obviously a challenge is some of these studies are about, you know, professional athletes, injuries to professional athletes or people who are on these fields way more than, I mean, they're still valuable um, to give you context, but um, sometimes it's not always an apples to oranges comparison to, you know, an Arlington youth soccer player who's on the field, you know, an hour, an hour a week, once a week, um, you know, so um but, you know, we've been looking, as, as I think Joe pointed out, we've been looking sort of at the injuries question, just, you know, sort of, you know, uh, the bruising, the concussions, the hip, ankle, neck injuries, uh, the comparison there. We've been looking at the heat issue, not the heat island issue. We'll leave that to the, the environment or the health group. But we, you know, been looking more at heat as it impacts the people who use the fields and then uh you know, sort of issues related to, you know, skin issues, uh, skin abrasions, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, inhalation. Um, and, you know, we're starting to definitely see some some patterns in the studies, you know, but more, 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 more is needed. I mean, Leslie, you've done a great job of kind of finding a lot of the literature and doing, you know, a good job of hiding us with, you know, a sampling and we're keep, we're, we're continue to dig, but any, anything you want to add? No, I mean, again, I think you're right. Um, we've been, you know, digging and trying to find relevant studies, things that are um, recent and, um, you know, the thing that we've looked at over the years is, Injury reporting, as Joe said, really is inconsistent. You know, it's it's really kind of um, very ad hoc. There's no um, real reporting that's done at the at the local level. But we have seen that you know a poorly maintained brass field is just as likely to cause injury as um, as anything. So, you know, we do need to dig a little bit deeper and, and we do have both, um, you know, athletic uh, and recreational uses that are on both types of fields where we can, you know, look at, at the sampling of, of what, what's, a, what's happening out there. And, you know, hopefully we can get some more information on it, but um, that's... It, it 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 is as you say kind of useful to understand the overall things that are that are going on uh with the studies but the studies have been high end uh professional collegiate and and that's that's really not the environment that um that we are trying to support we don't have that level of athlete um playing on our fields so um and, and you know more I, I think that's exactly right leslie another well two additional points about the safety group one is um some of the studies address and and you will all mercifully be be uh we we read about it but we won't be it's not part of our charge you know how the different actual games are affected by the difference in fields i don't think anyone here it's not part of our charge i don't think anyone here cares if a how a soccer ball bounces on one of these fields versus another. It's irrelevant to what we're looking at, but you know, some of these studies do look to those issues as well. And the other thing is we do face the same challenge the environment group does. You know, mm -hmm. obviously a lot of the studies are about the crumb rubber infill. And uh, I think we noted at our last meeting, it's reflected in the minutes. It's, we certainly should look at those studies. And in many cases, that's the majority of what's out there or the overwhelming majority. But if you were to go in a different direction and say we would never consider crumb rubber infill if we ever did artificial turf in town, and that the real interest area of interest or inquiry would be uh, studies about non-crumb rubber infill and the health effects and safety and environmental effects, there's just not a lot out there, at least we're seeing in the safety space either. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge. Uh, I mean, you know, because obviously you get a certain take on the crumb rubber infill and the safety issues and inhalation. And that's very specific to crumb rubber. And, you know, I forget is oyster shells. One of the thing I think I remember reading it is oyster shells. One of the, yeah, one of the things that's like <laughs> yeah. an alternate, you like, I, you know, we're not seeing what those Coconut studies say. Plus. 
Yeah. Um, so I think it's just a challenge all the groups are going to have. Yeah. You know, one thing that's come up is, you know, looking at, you know, there was a comment that was just made. I think one of the things that we talked about today, uh, and I think that the MIAA policy is very good at um, laying out is heat is heat. And when the MIAA looks to protect their athletes, they look at indoor heat, outdoor heat. It, it's, it really doesn't matter where the athlete is playing in order to protect the athlete. The heat is be, needs to be measured. Um, so I think that, you know, that that's a good uh, barometer of, of how at least our highest level athletes are being looked after from a health and safety standpoint with respect to heat. If it's too hot, it's too hot, regardless of whether it's uh, grass yeah. or um, artificial turf or, you know, they even mention, mention indoor heat and environment. So, you know, these organizations are looking um, out for the health and safety of the athlete overall and policies around what things need to be done to protect the athlete at various um, heat levels. So that, that I think is a very, you know, interesting thing that, you know, uh, Joe said, Joe sent out and, and I think, as you said, we're going to send around to everyone um, to take a look at. Yeah. And, you know, another challenge is, you know, talking about, well, you know, can you really compare like, you know, a study about a professional athlete using the fields, you know, the for most of the most of a week versus, you know, Arlington youth soccer players on there for an hour or two a week. Um, another challenge is we're seeing in these studies, um, you know, where are these, you know, especially on the heat question, you know, if you're looking at fields in Texas, Florida, California, you know, but particularly Texas, Florida, the southern United States, you know, uh, Nevada, you know, uh, it's helpful, but the temperatures in those, you know, as I always say, if you were coming to me and saying you're building an artificial turf field in Las Vegas, um, I mean, that's a field that for the better part of the year, if not the overwhelming part of the year is going to be, you know, in temperatures, 90 degrees or hotter, not the case in, in New England, not the case, you know, I mean, we're going to have more 90 degree days than we used to in the coming years, but, um, you know, just a very different, sort of different context, different calculus uh, about, you know, uh, how many truly hot days we have a year in Arlington, naturally hot, and then that's compounded by, you know, a crumb rubber infill field, artificial turf field, uh, you know, obviously, there's to some degree some of these things in a New England context could be man you know one of the things we're seeing is, is some of these things could be managed more than in a place where it could never really be managed because it's completely unmanageable the temperatures you know almost 365 days a year so you know sort of looking at a little bit in that realm but um, yeah. today when we talked the fact that it really in in our environment it's the shoulder seasons we don't have yeah the high intensity of use during the summer. What what we're seeing and what we're trying to support is those New England springs, shall we say, um, the, the, the wet months um, of spring and um, fall when, when the majority of the uh, schools and leagues and athletes really are trying to get out there and um, you know our recreational uses are the highest um, so again context as you said Jim mm. is part of really what we need to frame Marvin, you well. First of all, welcome. You, I had saw your hand. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Mike. First of all, um, my apologies. I got stuck in New Hampshire for work. I was supposed to be home two hours ago and just walked in the door ten minutes ago. Um, so, um, I guess a couple of things. One is, I think the the heat issue. Obviously, it's going to be really different than if we're in the south. But I think you know it's partially looking at you know 
the difference between grass fields and, and turf fields for heat. You know, certainly in June, August, early September, it can be really, really hot. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly if you've got people who um, don't happen to be really well conditioned to the heat that are, that are you know, coming on the field and playing with great intensity. Um, there were a number of presentations on heat stress at the National Industrial Hygiene Conference this year. Um, one of them, and, and there were a number of really interesting points that I had not been aware of before, but severe heat strain can have physiological effects even days later. So you can be exposed to really high heat levels on Monday um, and not have a whole lot on Tuesday and Wednesday, but go back on Thursday if it's a hot day. And there's some still residual stress, you know, to the body that's that's existing that can compound whatever the, the Thursday exposure is. Um, there were also a couple of presentations by industrial hygienists who worked at various colleges. Um, and their feeling was that for the most part, you know, coaches are very well-meaning, but aren't really well-trained in necessarily recognizing early stages of heat strain. Um, and particularly given that most kids just want to play, um, you know, I think about, you know, kids with, with you know, mild concussions who insist that they want to stay in the game, um, you know, without kind of additional training for, for staff. I think that that, you know, creates an issue. Um, I've been doing a, a whole bunch of stuff, not not on Chrome, but I've been looking at heat. Um, I've been looking at phthalates, um, you know, and, and some of the plastic components, um, looking at PFAS and in addition to, you know, the Chrome studies. Um, and and the other thing that's, that's kind of striking is most of the studies of Chrome have been done with cancer as an endpoint um, and have been done with one specific compound as opposed to kind of the mixture of assorted, you know, carcinogens that are present. Um, OSHA has a mixture permissible exposure limit for solvents because when you've got assorted compounds that have comparable effects on the body, um, it's additive. And so they've, they've done something like that for solvent exposures. Um, there is nothing like that for carcinogens. There's nothing like that for isocyanates, though, though the Europeans have that. So, um, there, there really haven't been tests of mixtures, and there also haven't been any studies that have really looked at other endpoints, you know, whether it's asthma, whether it's, you know, the effects of endocrine disruptors or anything like that. Um, you know, again, we're, we're kind of in a place where there's not been a whole lot of work done, which is unfortunate. And virtually every study I read says, you know, this just illustrates the need for more work to find out more stuff. Um, you know, so that's, you know, that's an issue. Um, in terms of the, you know, difference between kind of pros and college and, and, you know, high school students, I think one of the things is when you're looking at scientific research, you have to look at big numbers because small numbers may not really give you the information you want. So for example, I just got a, a safety, you know, a safety recall from Hyundai because of a brake issue. And it would be, if we looked at the, you know, if we said, well, let's let's see how many brake problems there have been, you know, from cars that were sold at my rack, and we'll base our actions on that. Um, obviously, you have to look at like big number sets, and you're looking at kind of you know relatively sometimes minor differences and things, but you know there there's still effects to to think about. So, um, that's you know, all. No, those are all really really good points, Marvin, and it reminds me how. How uh, lucky we are that you're you're in this group with us. So and and I don't you know, way. Pardon me. Into the health, if we're ready. <laughs> yeah, no health. If you guys are ready to transition to the health so, update, I'd, I'd love it. Marvin, we didn't do um, a health update just yet. Um, okay. What I had planned to do was just kind of give an overview of some of the the stuff that we have been looking at, and so okay. I've written down some of the stuff, and I'm just going to put it right out there. Jill and Marvin, I am so grateful. Um, to be part of this working group, they have really dove in and just gotten so many different things to look at. So um, some of the things that that we've been looking at, um, you know, to everyone's point, uh, you know, crumb rubber and, you know, the cancer risk, we sort of talked about that information about crumb rubber infill and synthetic turf fields. Um, we're looking at, uh, let's see, uh, synthetic a lot of the crumb rubber hazard assessment study on organic compounds and heavy metals from using artificial turf, um, human health risks associated 
uh, I'm sorry, assessment of synthetic turf fields based on investigation of five fields in Connecticut. So we have a Connecticut study. We've looked at some materials from the state of New York, the state of California. Um, we're still synthesizing a lot of this stuff, um, but these are sort of some of just the, the broad topics we have you know, um, I forget, I think it was Marvin who gave us uh, a presentation from University of Pennsylvania um, that sort of talks about the safety issues associated with artificial turf fields. So we have um, those types of things that we're also looking at. They're doing a lot of research there at New Penn. Um, we're looking at heat streams of various athletic surfaces. So a comparison between observed and modeled wet bulb globe temperatures. So these are just some of like the, the topics that we we haven't committed to what exactly we're going to, I guess, report out on, but these are like, I feel like we're doing a really good job of being all over the place and sort of trying to hone in on, on all of these different things to make sure that we're covering um, the health topics that, that we sort of feel are important. Um, we've got something from 2023, assessing children's potential exposures to harmful metals in tire crumb rubber by accelerated photo degeneration. I'm trying to read my own what, my own uh, writing here. Um, weathering, we've got uh, 20, something from 2020, 2017, heat strain on various athletic surfaces, comparison between observed and modeled wet bulb globe temperatures. Um, we've, we're looking at the Burlington Public School, um, you know, their policies around, you know, their, their heat plans. Um, I've reached out to the Brookline Health Department. They had a, a, a group that was working on, um, similar to us, like a, a study group, working on the field usage and, and you know, decision making around artificial turf fields. Um, so I've got a lot of those materials that, that we're sharing. Um, you know, together. And I think, you know, I think um, to, to Marvin's point there, I think what we're running into is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's a lot of materials out there and a lot of it is is sort of the crumb rubber piece that we've, we've talked about. But the alternative to that, there really aren't a lot of studies right now out there about any of the alternative things either. So it, it feels like we're a little bit torn in that, you know, this versus that or that. Ver I'm just throwing that out there. So I think that that's, that's one thing that we've acknowledged. Um, Jill has, could not be here tonight, but, um, you know, she also had been mentioning some um, concerns, you know, that don't exactly fall under health, but maybe the larger kind of group and maybe we could put them under health, but um, sort of, you know, like, accessibility, accessibility, um, and the mental health component. Um, so she's done some, some, some research into, um, you know, sort of studies that show, um, mental and physical, I'm sorry, physical activity and being part of sports is, uh, just as important. Um, although I don't know how much that correlates to the use of just in a, uh, you know, an artificial turf field, but where, you know, feeling like that's an important piece that we need to acknowledge. Um, but one thing that that we discussed as well is that, and Joe will Joe Conley will probably be reaching out to you, is maybe being able to get some of our own data here to understand, you know, in the last couple of years, how how many times have you had to cancel practices, um, and and how many fields, and what does that look like? So even if it's downpouring today, you know, are you canceling practice today on that field? Or are you also canceling it tomorrow, the next day, the next day? What does that impact look? And so I don't know if, if you guys have that data, but we felt that that was something that really might need to be um, discussed. And I think we wanted to get, you know, the thoughts of the group on that if if folks thought that that was an important piece. Um, and, you know, I've got more stuff that I can sort of talk about, but, um, you know, we're looking at Department of um, Chemical and Environmental Services, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, you know, we've we've got lots of different things that we're looking at for um, materials. And so I think what our group wants to do is is probably kind of do a little bit more of a deeper dive and figure out what this is all sort of saying, so that we can present it then to to this group um, in a more formalized way. Uh, and Marvin, I want I don't want to so sick of hearing my own voice. So I'm so glad that you're here. <laughs> and I wanna give you an opportunity to, to also um, just, you know, add in what, you know, we've, we've talked about as well. Sure, yeah. But um, huge kudos to my partners. Oh, 
and 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 Natasha is not exactly sitting on her hands either. So, um, you know, um, no, mostly there's 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 a lot of information out there, um, and it's just a matter of trying to figure out what's relevant. Um, and so, for example, you know, what I've been looking at is really kind of exclusively peer reviewed peer reviewed journal articles. Um, I'm not looking at really anything by advocacy groups, you know, on either side of the issue, um, because I, I don't think that that's going to be particularly helpful. Um, you know, if our charge is, is kind of to deliver a report that's, you know, hopefully as accurate as possible and comprehensive to town meeting, um, then that's what we should be doing. And I want to do that really kind of, you know, based on fact and not opinion to certainly to the extent possible. Um, you know, I think that that's, that's how this committee has credibility. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a really important thing to do. Um, so again, I just, you know, I just kind of touch briefly on, on some of the, you know, some of the things that, that, that we're looking at. Um, there's, there's obviously more to do and, and, you know, I would hope, you know, over the next, you know, couple of three weeks to, to flush out some areas that, that I feel like, you know, I'd like to see a little bit more on, um, you know, one study leads to another, leads to another, I, you know, start reading footnoted articles and, and, you know, sometimes that's really productive and sometimes it just kind of goes off into a direction that, you know, isn't really quite as relevant. Um, so I'm really just tr trying to kind of stay as centrally focused as possible for now. Um, okay. And again, you know, once, yeah. once we get everything organized, I mean, I would like our group to be able to present something to the rest of the group in kind of an organized fashion that's, that's relatively easy to digest, as opposed to just like, you know, throwing links to journal articles, you know, I mean, ev everybody has more than enough stuff to do with their time now. Um, and I don't want to, you know, be in the position of just kind of dumping stuff in people's laps for them to try to sort out. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do this in a way that, um, makes a little bit of sense. Um, and, and, yeah. is, is, and it's easy for people. I mean, that's, I really look at that as part of our function. Well, you know, you raise a good point, Marvin, and here's what I'd say. Uh, and I, and I don't know. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves and say this is how we're going to write the final recommendations, final report. But, you know, maybe each group should sort of proceed over the next you know, few weeks as they're doing what they're doing with the idea of it's almost like if we were writing a report and you had the section to deal with, in this case, health or environment or safety, you know, what would you be putting in that section? You know, if you were saying, you know, this is going to be the section that says this is what, you know, what our deep dive looked at, and this is what our conclusions or recommendations are from that, from at least that vantage point, you know, in you know, the two or three pages that are going to go in this report about that subject matter, what would, what would that look like if you synthesized? I mean, so it's maybe try to keep that, I don't know if that's what we'll ultimately do, but try to keep that as you're, as you're synthesizing information and trying to figure out next steps. Think about that, you know, because it sounds like Marvin, you're already kind of maybe there in terms of, you know, how do we bring this to the group in a, comp you know, comprehensive but also concise, and and, um, you know, fully digested way. Well, as I mean, this, to just this is a the mishmash of sites. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is the way I've worked in groups in the past when when you know there have been kind of divisions of labor and in, in terms of things, um, and it just is a lot easier to kind of present something that's. I don't know, more organized and, and more concise to people. Um, again, given that I don't think any of us are just kind of, you know, sitting around eating bonbons, waiting for somebody to hand us stuff. I mean, you know, I, I certainly have a day job, um, you know. So you know, I think yeah. that brings up a really important point, uh, Jim, is that I don't know if you want to go this way, but there, it might help if each of the subgroups report uh, that eventually turns out has the same structure uh, so that, you know, we had uh, considerations, we had findings, we have recommendations or something along those lines uh, that would make it easier for folks reading the report to figure out what's, what's going on. And um, I, I fully agree with both of you with saying that there's more research and papers and information out there that we could possibly deal with uh, in any one of these subgroups. But I think if we structure the each, each part of the report in a similar way, it might be helpful for the readers. 
Yeah, Natasha and I will talk about that. If maybe we can, on our own, work on a template that maybe we can share with the group either at the next meeting or the meeting after that, and and then we can discuss whether people would like the template for 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 you know for their section or if they want to tweak the template. Um, I think so. For the next, you know, I. I'm cognizant of the time, and I know we don't say this is a hard stop in an hour, but you know, I, I do do know people's time is 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 quite valuable. Um, so you know, subject matter experts and additional research needs and gaps. Here, here's what I'd say about that. Now that we're after six o'clock, um, we do have the next meeting coming up very fast because there's a Monday holiday, um, and on this. I wanted to spend some significant time on this part about research gaps uh, and um, needs uh, because I got a few recommendations from various folks about things that didn't necessarily neatly fall within um, within any of the working groups, but that you know were kind of essential issues we needed to cover and uh, sort of bring some questions slash suggestions to the larger group. Um, we, we, we've sort of indirectly touched on a little bit of them, like the financial issues, what are the costs and comparisons between building and maintaining a, a regular natural turf field and an artificial turf field, uh, field demand and usage. Um, you know, there are other issues. I don't want to shortchange that discussion. So Natasha, I'd recommend carrying that over to the next agenda item, yes. next meeting and making that maybe one of the more central pieces because, you know, in a week, there may not be a huge change in the report out for the other things. So maybe we can make that other element bigger part of our meeting. Um, I'm also wondering, Jim, if, if we sort of just try to look at the calendar now and say, you know what, it might be a good idea for each of the groups to say, we're going to have some sort of a report out to about what our working group has done and what that looks like to each other. You know, I don't know, by the 30th. I don't know if that's too late or if that's not enough time. Or I don't think it's too late. I don't think too it's much too late. Um, um, yeah. That gives us almost like the three weeks. Like we're still coming together to talk about things and we can address like, hey, we're going in this direction. Do you think that there's anything else that we might be missing? That gives us that opportunity to also talk about like additional like research mm -hmm. needs and things without, it doesn't have to be necessarily a topic, but I think on that 30th, we might then be able to, have that as well as like okay or maybe it's the next meeting like we've we've done all this and i think you know maybe we're missing this this and this how are we going to get there and complement that um sorry jim no I'm, i i think it's a good point i think what i'd suggest at this point is maybe natasha you and i i'll call you tomorrow maybe we can talk okay. about some of the logistics and make some proposals to the group um about potential dates and then uh because I do, I think we need should nail down some sort of for scheduling purposes, some some dates to work towards. Um, but I'm realizing like Joe and and Jill aren't on this call, and I don't want to like make anything too hard and fast with two of our members not here right now. Right. Um, I mean, the other thing I'd say that's really important, maybe between now and the next meeting, although it's not a you know drop dead deadline, but the more that each of the subgroups could think about people they might want to. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, that you've locked them down, but people you'd like to invite or are working on, on inviting uh, to to come and do a sort of brief presentation and Q&A with our group at meetings in February. Um, the more we can have a sense of that by the next meeting, or at least a sense of the work you're doing in that regard to, to get someone would be very helpful. Um, and so, are people sort of comfortable with, with, you know, I, and, and by the way, it should be now go without saying the subgroup should keep meeting, you know, meet, meet as much or as little as you want to, but, you know, I won't say, oh, this is a week to meet. This is not a week. To, the subgroup should meet as much or as little as they want at this point uh, and don't need further direction from us other than, you know, keep up the good work. Um, but, uh, you know, this meeting has been helpful to me in sort of thinking about some additional areas, you know, of inquiry, not just in my group, but sort of for the larger group. So are people comfortable with, you know, a week from today, coming back from a long weekend, for some of us, at least, I think, or most of us, um, you know, covering this gaps, research gaps, or additional needs issue more in depth, rather than trying to just sort of 
quickly, you know, talk about it for five minutes now. Mm -hmm. uh, having the usual report out with maybe an emphasis on trying to specify also, you know, potential guest speakers. Um, and then um, maybe at that point, Natasha and I can also present a potential template for, for final, you know, a template for final recommendations for each group, uh, as well as um, possible dates, you know, for, you know, deadlines for work. That all makes sense. Yeah. And um, but I know time is short, and I know our goal is still to be done with all this, or it's not our goal, it's our requirement to be done with all this by some point in mid to late March. It's going to sneak up on us quickly, especially with February being a short month, although it's a leap year. It's not as short as it, as it could be. Um, but, you know, time is short. I still am pretty confident we can get to where we need to be without requesting an extension. You know, the next few weeks will really determine that. But I, I think this group can do its job and do it well without having to compromise on anything. But I think that's because I believe in the, the power of the people in this group and the talent. So. Uh, don't don't prove me wrong. Don't make don't make a liar out of me. <laughs> um, so are people good with next Tuesday at five? And Natasha and I will talk tomorrow and try to iron out or make a few proposals and various things. And then subgroups or working groups keep keep chugging along. Yeah. yeah. And um, Marvin, I just wanted to to ask too if you have an idea or like. Some I know you've worked on groups where you've done something like this. If you have any examples, I'm happy to take a look at those as well. Maybe Jim and I can can kind of look and just give us some sort of guidance and idea. Truth be told, and to be perfectly honest, I've I've never really had to write out a report like this, so this is new to me. Um, and so I I would welcome any kind of um, you know template or or thoughts on that. Yeah, and you know, and and we can maybe have an anyway. item, maybe even at the next meeting or the meeting after, we can have an item of what each person's vision of a final product looks like. I mean, to some degree, you know, it's a preliminary discussion because, you know, you don't, you don't build the plane while you're flying it, but, you know, um, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily helpful to town meeting if we submit a, you know, 75 page report, unless, you know, it's a 10 page report and 65 pages are, you know, helpful sources and appendices and stuff. I mean, I just think if it's 75 pages of text, um, I think we know where reports like that end up. You know, there's a few hardcore folks who read it and the rest will end up in a pile and collecting dust. I mean, I think it's better to have a, you know, report that can have lots of citations and appendices, but ultimately, you know, is easy to read and concise and, you know, gives you a packs a powerful punch in, you know, a dozen pages or less. Um, that's my view, but Marvin? I, I would just say that you know certainly there there's an advantage to brevity, but at the same at the same point, um, some of these are fairly complex issues, right. and I think to try and distill something down into you know four or five sentences and then have a whole bunch of references, it may actually not be as helpful because I think you know when you're dealing with you know particularly scientific research, it's sometimes takes a little bit to explain what's actually going on. Um, and I would rather have a little bit more length than that and have people kind of get a sense of what's going on as opposed to counting on them to actually start reading these papers, which again, for, yeah. you know, for well, people who are also... reading research papers, it, it can be a little daunting. There's also alternate paths, right? Like you can have a longer, a longer report and then, you know, maybe more of a concise PowerPoint presentation summarizing the report. You know, that's more easily digestible to I, someone who has less time. You can and, certainly have a couple of page executive summary of it, yeah. but have sections attached to it um, yeah. with with kind of more explanation. And, and that might work. And I did see a comment in the chat, and I, I just want to reiterate, you know, I think at a prior meeting we did say, you know, when we're looking at these studies, obviously, you know, look at whatever you want to look at, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but, you know, that the emphasis and that the prioritization and the hierarchy of these studies would be for things, you know, obviously, you know, peer reviewed, uh, government issued, you know, these would be sort of at the top of the hierarchy and things that are not peer reviewed or 
industry folk, industry backed, you know, or supported would be kind of probably more towards the bottom of the hierarchy. I don't think there's anything wrong with reading an industry report. I just think, you know, you have to keep it in context all the way through and, you know, take it for what it's worth, which, you know, may or may, may not be that much. Um, so with all that said, any new business or new items to bring up before I entertain a motion to adjourn? I just want to add one more time. Um, we've got a holiday on Monday. So if there are any materials that anyone would like to be included in next week's meeting, please get those to me as soon as possible. I do plan to get the packet out and posted by Thursday morning. So I can only accept materials until four o'clock tomorrow, which is Wednesday. So I apologize. It just is what it is. Um, and I'm taking a couple days off. So I think you're That's entitled to them, Natasha. <laughs> well, let's not be crazy. It's we're going to a hockey tournament. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you, and uh, hope we haven't scared off Claire. Hope she's still uh, still still wants to stick with us. Uh, <laughs> um, I appreciate. Is there is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Who seconded? Uh, Marvin. Marvin. Um, motion made by Mike, seconded by Marvin. So um, I guess with that, uh, nope. Natasha, will you call the roll? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, Mike? Yep. Um, Leslie? Yes. Joe Barr is not present. Let me just write that down. Um, Jill is not present. Uh, Natasha, yes. Uh, Marvin? Yes. And Jim? Yes. Perfect. We are adjourned. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, folks. We'll talk soon. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Hey. Good night. Bye.